Uh, good, evening. good evening. It's good to come back after a really edifying week at convention. Um, some things from that week may come out in tonight's class. I don't know. Uh, it's hard not to at this point. It's like it's coming out of my ears. You know, just so much stuff crammed in that um, it's hard not to come out. Um, so tonight we're going to get into Acts 9. I was looking at the classes so far that we've put up online. And so far we've done four, uh, 14 classes. Um, seven weeks, two classes a week, 14 classes. And I thought that was interesting because there's 28 classes in a semester. Um, and we're not even into Acts 9 yet. So um, I have to start moving faster. Uh, but I think we won't get through Acts 9 tonight uh, because of what Acts 9 is and um, the notes that I have. Um, X9 is the calling of Paul, the apostle, the uh, really amazing testimony of what happened to him um, and then how he got called by God. Pastor Chevalier says it's what, like reading X9 is what saved him. He's very public about what it was. He was high on drugs. Um, uh, birth of his daughter, he opened up to X9 and he thought, if God can save him, God can save me. And he gave his life to Christ. And the rest is history, uh, so to speak. Uh, but so we, Acts 9 is really one of those incredible, it's change the course of history type chapters. The Bible's full of those type chapters. Uh, but this is a big one in the history of the church. That's uh, what happened to Paul and his call. And we'll talk a lot about Paul's call and our call um, in this class, what that actually means. Um, so... Uh, Acts chapter 9, so we're going to see one misconception here um, that maybe I know it's the Bible college class to, to maybe move past. Um, I've heard it talked about, I've heard it preached in um, various forms, that this is where Saul became Paul. And that's not actually true. Um, Saul was always Saul, and Paul was always Paul, and it, God never changed his name. Um, his name was Saul. So we see that in Acts chapter 9, nine verse 17, we see... Sorry, I'm actually going to be reading out of the King James tonight, um, King Jimmy. Um, <laughs> verse 17, it says, um, actually not 17, it's number 7, right? Or, um, verse 4, sorry. Jesus calls him Saul in verse 4. He says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Um, in 13.2, when it says, when the Holy Spirit separates Saul and Barnabas, he says, separate from me Saul and Barnabas in 13.2. And actually 11 times in the book of Acts, after his conversion, he's referred to as Saul um, and not Paul. He was first referred to as Paul in Acts chapter 13. Uh, if you look at 13 verse 9, uh, Luke writes, Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on, uh, on him. You know, so we see this. This is the first transition over to Paul. From this point on, Luke calls him Paul. And the reason why is because Acts chapter 13, we see the birth of missions. Saul was his good Jewish name. That was, that was his Hebrew name. Uh, going back to his great, 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 don't know how many great grandfathers, Saul. Um, Paul was actually from the tribe of Benjamin. Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. So they named him after Saul. Uh, when he starts traveling to the Gentiles, he refers to himself and they refer to him as Paul because that was his Gentile name. It's the way he did business in the Gentile world. For them to receive him, it was easier for them to receive him using his Roman, his Roman commerce name rather than his Jewish name. And he was the apostle called to the Gentiles. We'll see this in chapter 9. So, I mean, it's a really good... Thought, good idea, Saul to Paul, um, but it's not actually, it's not actually there. Um, so <laughs> it, it's a good thought, and it makes a really good thought for a message, and I'm sure it could be a powerful message of our pre-conversion, post-conversion, what Christ will do. Um, but it's not just because it's, it's good to know, good, good to know the stuff. So, um, so in verse one of chapter nine, uh, we see in Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, um, that if he found any of this way, any Christians, any of this way, the way of Christ, 
whether they were men or women, he may bring them bound unto Jerusalem. So I wanted a map for this, and I'm, I apologize that I'm not completely, I'm not uh, prepared that way. So let me see if there's a map in the back of this one. There is. Uh, anywho. So we'll say that this um, Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, we'll see the Dead Sea down here, um, Jerusalem, uh, in relation to this, um, somewhere around here. So it's, <coughs> this is Samaria, remember? And then up here is like Damascus. Bad picture, I know, and I'm sorry. Uh, but Damascus. So Paul, and this is, shows what the persecution of Saul was doing to the church. So the previous chapter, chapter 8, we see Samaritans, the Samaritans getting saved. We see the trip to Gaza um, and the Ethiopian eunuch. It's spreading now even to Damascus, which wasn't part of Judea. It was past Samaria. It was in Syria. Damascus was out there. And there was a big Jewish population there. Um, so Paul, Saul, sorry. I, I will use Saul here because it's, um, I don't know, because that's what they said. So. Um, but up here is where Saul was going, and he wanted to weed out these Christians. They were in Jerusalem, they were in Judea, they were in Samaria, and he was going all the way up to Damascus, and he was going to um, drag them out of their homes. And this is where he was, he was almost there. He was right there. Uh, uh, history says, like some traditions say, there's a bridge entering into Damascus, and he was coming down a hill into a valley, about to cross over this bridge where he had this encounter. He's right there, right about to reach into Damascus. So first I want to talk about is this word breathing out threatenings in slaughter against the disciples and what this actually was. The word breathing out, it's not really translated that great in the King James. When we think of breathing out, we think of like the, ex, the, the expulsion, that the force coming out. But this word is empneo. And it means actually breathing in or breathing on. <coughs> breathing in or on. And what he's saying is that Saul was breathing, like this was his life. Everything about him was threatenings and slaughter against, um, the, the, against the disciples. His entire life, he wasn't just breathing out this rage. It was everything breathing in him also. Like, this was a reciprocal thing. He breathed in the, um, the martyrdom of Stephen. He breathed it in, then he was breathing out his threatenings against the rest of the church. And every time he persecuted somebody, he was breathing it in and then breathing it out. And it was more of a reciprocal thing going on in him. The Greek uh, breathing out isn't really a good translation. The Greek really goes a lot deeper into what this actually means. It was like his life breath was to, was threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. And um, I just want to read um, this from one of the commentators. He said, threatening and slaughter had become the very breath that Saul breathed. Like a war horse who sniffed the smell of battle, he breathed on the remaining disciples the murder that he had already breathed in from the death of the others. He exhaled what he inhaled. You know, like this was Paul. And if you look at an interesting verse, is Genesis chapter 49. Way back. Way back to Genesis, and this is the blessing of the 12 sons in Genesis chapter 49. And remember, Paul was of the tribe of Benjamin, he says in Philippians. And like this was the tribe he was from. So we look at the blessing of the sons from Jacob. <coughs> Genesis 49, verse 27, it says, Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. And it's like Paul was the, the last fulfillment of this prophecy. Um, you know, Saul was the, from the tribe of Benjamin, and he was raven as a wolf. He was tearing as a wolf, it says, like, like, how, like a wolf would tear his prey. Um, and we see that, actually, if you look throughout the... Um, in Judges, there was this war going on with the tribe of Benjamin. I think it's uh, Judges chapter 10. I believe I'll find that out in the break, 10 to 12. 
Um, and then you have actually King Saul, right? King Saul, um, the first uh, king of Israel, was from the tribe of Benjamin. And he was, uh, he, he was very warlike, very um, uh, threatening type man, uh, not very spirit-filled most of the time. And so we see this also with Saul. And it says that the taste of blood and the death of Stephen was pleasing to young Saul, and now he reveled in the slaughter of the saints, both men and women. And here, um, in verse 2, it says that um, it's actually three times, uh, three times it mentions uh, persecuting women. In Acts 8.3, Acts 9.2, and Acts 22.4, it mentions the, the, uh, that Saul persecuted women. Um, and this is very, this, this says a lot, um, actually, here. What it shows is the brutality that was in this man's heart. Um, that it was, he was zealous for the truth in a very bad way, and he was actually persecuting men and women. And anytime you see that, like in, in the Bible, you see that, it, it just shows in, in, in like a brutality that, that goes above and beyond. And that's kind of where this man's, where his mind was. Um, it says, whether they were men or women, that he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. Um, he wasn't a good guy. You know, he wasn't a good guy. And that's what makes X9 just so much more mind-blowing when we see what Jesus does. Amen. It's like, whoa, because like, he was really that bad of a man. Like, you know, like he wasn't he wasn't good. Um, and then we mentioned a few weeks ago when we talked about the stoning of Stephen, uh, we mentioned, like, under what authority did Paul have this? Uh, like, like, who gave him the okay to do these things? Uh, Stephen was kind of a special case um, because it was more of a mob mentality. Uh, Stephen was preaching that they, they didn't really have the time to go through the certain channels. And it seemed like the Romans just kind of turned their back on it, said, okay, whatever, you guys handle yourselves, he's dead now, good for you guys, we're not going to handle this. Normally it wasn't kind of like that when you see in, um, um, actually in John 18, 31, when the Jews brought Jesus up to Pilate, Pilate said, why don't you handle this yourselves? Like, why don't you take care of this? He's your guy. He's a Jew. He's talking about the religious stuff. Handle him yourself. And they said, you, you did not give us the authority. Rome, we don't have the authority to put anyone to death. Um, so we see that the Jews at the time didn't have that authority to put people to death. But Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar, his son, right? Augustus was his son? Okay. Um, uh, I remember July and August. That was what they were named after. July and August. Or, yeah, gotcha. Um, so Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar, um, they granted the high priest uh, jurisdiction over the Jews. They said, you can handle the Jews. But capital punishment still kind of it relied on the, um, the, they had to go through the Romans. So here when it says that they were, that Paul was delivering them up, what he would have done is he had the letters from the Sanhedrin. When it says the letters in verse 2, he got letters from the high priest to arrest these people because uh, Julius and Augustus, Rome, gave them the okay to arrest people, gave them the okay to handle things themselves. And then if it came to a capital crime, they would have went up to Rome and said something like, these people are inciting riots. They're talking about Jesus being the king of Israel. Hey, Caesar's the king of Israel. What are they talking about? then they would have been put to death from there. Um, and we see that throughout like the early part of church history. When the early church was persecuted and put to death, that's usually the charge that they came up with, is that they were um, blaspheming Caesar um, by saying that Jesus is, is God, by saying Jesus is their Lord. Um, and a lot of riots would happen from that. Um, so in... Uh, Damascus, like we said, Damascus was, it's about 130 miles northeast of Jerusalem. And Paul had the authority to go to Damascus from the high priest. And um, he actually says it in Acts 26, 10, that he, he came authority from the high priest and the elders, which are the Sanhedrin, it says in Acts 22, verse 5. There are three chapters that kind of talk about what's going on in Acts 9. You have Acts 9, 22... And 26. You have three different accounts of this, um, the conversion of Paul, uh, three different accounts of the vision. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to read through the vision and we're going to talk about it a little bit because some people 
some atheists, some you know, really smart guys have said, wait, these three accounts are different. It must not be true. Ah, oh, these silly Christians in the Bible, they can't get anything right. This is obviously wrong. We'll talk about that a bit. Um, of um, how the reason why some of the accounts don't really line up with the others. Uh, so in verse 3 it says, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. If you have a different version of the Bible, it might not have that in it. It's, um, the earliest, best manuscripts actually don't have that part in it. It's actually from, um, I believe, 22, Acts chapter 22. And they copied it over to Acts chapter 9, the King James Version. Um, and trembling and astonished, uh, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice and seeing no man. And Saul rose from the earth. When his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but was led by his hand, brought him in, uh, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Um, let's pause there, and we'll, talk, we'll kind of pick this apart a little bit. Um, so, then again, I mentioned that it's hard to kick against the pricks. That's actually later on in the, uh, I think it's 22 or 26, it actually mentions that. And uh, they copy, some of the manuscripts copy it over into Acts 9. But in the best manuscripts, it's actually not there in Acts chapter 9. Um, sorry, just, I thought I wrote it down. Um, so we mentioned the, the three accounts of the vision. So we have Acts 9. This is Luke's account of the, just the historical timeline. Uh, Acts chapter 22 is when Paul is actually addressing the mob in Jerusalem, when he has to tell the mob of Jews that, hey, um, this is what happened to me. And then in Acts chapter 26, it's with Agrippa, King Agrippa. He told Agrippa, like, hey, this is what happened to me. So there's three separate accounts of Paul's conversion in the book of Acts. Um, and they all, they all say the same thing in these five different areas. The first thing they say that's, that they corroborate is, Saul is on his way to Damascus to gather up Christians. Like they, they all agree that he was on his way to Damascus to, to gather up Christians to be arrested. Um, the second thing they agree on is that he saw an intense light. They, they all mention the light that he saw. Um, third thing is that the Lord asks why Saul is persecuting him. Um, the Lord asks, like, Saul, Saul, why, why persecutest thou me? Right in the King James. Um, also, Saul asks who the speaker is. Oh, Lord, who are you? Right? Who art thou, Lord? And the fifth, it's uh, Jesus reveals that it is Jesus. <laughs> uh, those are the things that all of them agree on. Um, one of the, the biggest difference, the biggest one that's um, skeptics and um, atheists or most skeptics uh, say is the difference between hearing and seeing. So Acts chapter 9 verse 7 says that the men which journeyed with him stood speechless hearing a voice and see seeing no man. So uh, 9 it's uh, they heard heard no let's see and uh, in chapter 9, they heard, but they didn't see any man. Um, in Acts chapter 22, verse 9, Paul's account to the people, he says it a little bit differently. It says, And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were, and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake, that, that saw, um, uh, of him that, sorry, I just lost it. That spake to me. So here it says they um, saw, but they didn't hear. Right? They um, saw the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice. Saw, no. Hear. 
So how do we reconcile this? Is this a discrepancy in the Bible? And it's actually, it's no, it's actually beautiful. Um, and actually, uh, it, it's perfect. Um, so, so I just want to go back to my notes. Um, so the first thing is the seeing. Um, so they, in Paul, in chapter 22, it says they saw the light. Um, and in 9, verse 7, it says they saw no man. You can, so they saw the light, but they didn't see Jesus, is what they did there. So in verse 22, they saw the light, but they didn't see the man. Like, you know, and, and that, that's important. Um, so there's, there's no discrepancy there. Um, and so in chapter 9, it says they saw no man. In 22, it said they saw the light. Um, and those aren't a contradiction. Um, the herd is the interesting one. So in, in chapter 9, herd is, so I'm going to run out of room here, is phone. Um, so that's herd, it's phone, and it just means sound. So in chapter 9, it says they, um, they, they, they heard a sound, and it's, it's an indescribable sound. In chapter 22, verse 9, it's that they, um, it's a kuo, it's a different word. Mm -hmm. A kuo, and it's understand. Um, so right here where it's saying they, they, they heard, so here they just heard a sound. In chapter 22, it's saying they it's not saying that it's saying that they didn't understand what was going on. They didn't understand the sound. So in, uh, just to kind of go back to chapter 22, verse 9. Is this making sense? Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. 22, verse 9. It says, And they were with me, saw indeed the light, and were afraid, but they heard not the voice. They didn't hear the... Um, uh, they didn't hear the... Uh, they didn't hear the kuo, the phone. They didn't understand the sound. And Paul understood the sound. So it shows that the men that were with him, they saw that something was going on. There were there were there was light there, there was a sound there, but Paul got the real vision. Paul he spoke to Paul by name. He didn't speak to these guys by name. And that's the real difference there. So what they saw is that something was going on, something miraculous was going on. Paul knew it was for him. They knew it was Jesus Christ that was talking to him. And it's like how Jesus will talk to us in certain things and the people around us will have no idea what's going on. You know, and it happens. Maybe not uh, a light shone about us like uh, like it did with Paul, but it happens all the time. How two, how a dozen people can be sitting in the same message and we can get so familiar with the word of God, but like one person's like, whoa, that, that I hear the Lord there. It's different here. And we say, ah, oh, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. And then somebody, one person will say, no, God so loved me. And, you know, it's like a whole different meaning when we get the, uh, um, the rhema from God, the word, the specific word from God. Um, and I kind of, I like the idea here, like that these men, they saw the light, they didn't see Jesus. Um, they heard the sound, they didn't hear the Lord. But Paul did, but Paul did. Um, it reminds me of Isaiah. It says, seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear. Absolutely. It yeah, me. it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like there's, we, we see that there's something going on, but it's like, no, I, I see the Lord who loves me and the Lord who called me. Um, two more differences that aren't really much of anything. Um, Ananias, the man who went and saw, found Paul in Damascus, he's not mentioned in Acts chapter 26. Not that it matters. Paul didn't really have to go into that much detail with Agrippa. He just kind of wanted to talk to Agrippa, give Agrippa the gospel, give him his testimony. Um, and also the Gentile call is not in Acts chapter 9. Paul mentions it in Acts 22 and 26 when he's talking to the Jews and he's talking to Agrippa, but he doesn't mention it in 9. But it is mentioned to Ananias in 9 verse 15. So we see a little bit of a discrepancy there, but not enough to say, wait a minute, this is conflicting... Um, uh, reports. Um, it's, it's actually not conflicting at all. It's, um, and it actually shows Luke's um, Luke's real like, determination for the truth. 
to really like he didn't look didn't try to make them all fit together perfectly and i love that and actually like when you see uh when people when like police officers have a crime scene and they hear different reports from people and if they get the same exact wording from every single person it raises a red flag to them there's something wrong um they actually there has to be a little bit of a difference. You have a point of view from across the street, the second story window is different than the point of view down here, and they hear different things, so it's good that Luke would actually write it down as he heard it, and write it down exactly as he heard it, and not try to change it to make it all fit nicely. I, I appreciate that from Luke. Um, and it really shows Luke's credibility as a writer, also, that, that we can trust his credibility um, as a historian. Um, yeah, time loop just doesn't stop, right? <laughs> it just keeps on going. Um, all right, so Acts 9, verse 6. Um, and imagine this. So we just talked about Paul breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples and what that actually meant. That was his life. And then in verse 5, it's, I am Jesus. You know, it's like, that word rocked him <laughs> like that cut him down so hard and it says in verse um six that and he trembling and astonished he was trembling and astonished trembling and terrified like physically shaken um about that word i am jesus those three words i am uh jesus who you persecute like i'm jesus who you are killing um and what is Paul's uh, response here? And uh, like this is like like what is what is the response? Okay, can you please explain this to me a little bit, Lord? Can I go back to the Sanhedrin and discuss this a little bit to maybe get an intellectual understanding of what you're telling me here? That's not what he said. He says, "Lord, what will you have me to do?" Immediately, immediately, like it was immediate repentance. It's like my whole life just crumbled in three words. I am Jesus. Okay, well, what will you have me to do? I repent. I understand. I see you. I hear you. You are God. What will you have me to do? There was no arguing at that point. There was no, yeah, you're Jesus, but. Yeah, I understand you have something good. Yeah, but. Um, he says, no. Okay. What will you have me to do, Lord? Um, and... We'll actually go into that a little bit more in a, in a few verses. And it says that it shows that he's immediately humbled, subdued, and ready to do God's will. Immediately humbled before God. And he gave himself up at once and entirely to the Lord Jesus, um, evidently with a purpose to do his will alone. It was complete. There was no holding back at this point. There's no. Um, uh, Pastor, Schaller, Pastor Schaller gave an amazing message on Missions Night in, in Baltimore about um, Moses and the staff in Exodus and how Moses was scared, didn't really know what was going on, the authority of what was going on. And, and God said, what is that in your hand? And the staff in his hand, he says, okay, drop it to the ground. And like, so he, he has his staff, like his, 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 his support, his, uh, everything on him, like it holds him up, it's his staff. Like the staff back then is really important for everything, for walking, for living and he has his staff in his hand and God says drop it and that's a shower day but um, he says drop it and then he says okay now, now it turned into a snake and it shows that like everything he had dear he dropped it before God and he realized that he held it too dear and that it was too much and that then God told him to pick it up and he picked it up by the town with the staff again but now Moses had authority over now it was something in his life that wasn't authority over him, but he had authority over. And just kind of reminds me here, like when Paul was at the point where he's like, okay, Lord, no, now it's you. It's all you. It's not about me anymore. Um, it's, uh, it, it's about you. Like, like all of my life is yours. Um, so, and so then God tells, the Lord tells him, arise, go into the city, and shall be told you, uh, told thee what thou must do. Um, and the men journeyed with him, stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul rose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And in verse 9, is so I actually have a, a very long 
excerpt that I, that I found from uh, Jameson Fawcett Brown that I thought was too good not to read. Uh, but it says in verse 9, And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Like, so Paul, he saw, like, something different happened in his life, and it wasn't... Um, it wasn't time to go about life as normal. Well. One, he was blind, you know, like he couldn't see after this. But even more than that, it's like, okay, I need to spend some time in contemplation before God. I need to fast over this and really think about what's going on. And this, I just want to read this really quick because I, I couldn't put it in better words. It says, <clears throat> Such a period of entire abstinence from food in that state of mental absorption and revolution into what he had been so, so suddenly thrown um, is in perfect harmony with known laws and numerous facts. But what three days those must have been. Only one other space of three days duration can be mentioned of equal importance in the history of the world. Since Jesus had been revealed not only to his eyes but to his soul, the double conviction must have immediately flashed upon him this whole reading of the Old Testament hitherto had been wrong, and the same system of legal righteousness in which he had up to that moment rested and prided himself was false and fatal. What material, what materials these for spiritual exercise during those three days of total darkness, fasting, and solitude? On the one hand, what self-condemnation, what anguish, what death of legal hope, what difficulty in believing that in such a case there could be hope at all, on the other hand, what heartbreaking admiration for the grace that had pulled him out of the fire. What rest, resistless conviction that there must, have, must be a purpose of love in it. And what tender expectation of being yet honored as a chosen vessel to declare what the Lord had done for his soul, to spread abroad the Savior of that name, which he had so wickedly, though ignorantly, sought to destroy, must have struggled in his breast during those memorable days. It is, is it too much to say that all... That profound insight into the Old Testament, that comprehensive grasp of the principles of the divine economy, that penetrating spirituality, that vivid apprehension of man's lost state, and those glowing <coughs> views of the perfection and glory of the divine remedy, that beautiful ideal of the loftiness and the lowliness of the Christian character, that large philanthropy and burning zeal to spend and be spent through all his future life for Christ, which distinguished the writings of the chiefest of the apostles and the greatest of men, were all quickened into life during those successive days. Like, what was going on inside of this man during those days? Everything. Like, the realization that he had done such damage to the church, that he was really persecuting Christ, really killing Christ, and then the realization immediately after. I mean, when we talk about total depravity, we've mentioned it in this class, how important that doctrine is to our lives. We need to know how depraved we are. I don't think any of us have been where Paul was those three days when it comes to total depravity. Like, he would have saw how, just, what he had done to the church. And then the revelation of grace. Like, yes, I sent men and women bound to Jerusalem to await a death penalty, but God just called me. Like, what is this? And we have, like, it's just, it's an amazing thing to think about. Like, really, what Paul was going through those three days. And, like, how could he be? You know? And it wasn't like, let me fast to think about God for a little bit. It's like, I, I couldn't even think about food. I couldn't, and this is kind of what Paul's going through. Like, how can I spend my time doing anything else? And kind of an account on this is Galatians chapter 1. Verses 15 and 16. It says, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, this is where God called Paul by his grace, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Um, immediately I confer not with flesh and blood. You know, to reveal Christ in him. He needed those days of just sitting there, thinking on Christ, meditating on Christ, and Christ was being worked in him. Uh, I can't remember what pastor said it during the convention, 
but he mentioned that Paul's doc, Paul's theology was in Christ. You know, we are in Christ in Colossians three three. We're in Christ, we're in God with Christ in Colossians three three. But like that's kind of Paul's theology is that everything is in Christ. It's all in Christ. It's like none of me, all of Christ. Uh, Charles Spurgeon wrote a book called All of Grace, and it's kind of like along those lines. So we have that, and Paul sitting in solitude in Damascus by himself, just kind of going over the total depravity and the grace of God. And then, like, what better man to send to the Gentiles, really, than that? Like, okay, you want some hard, some hard training? Three days alone without food with the Lord. <laughs> like, and then he went to Arabia. We see also in Galatians, actually, the next verse after that, Galatians 1, talks about him going to Arabia to be alone and taught by Jesus Christ personally. We don't know much about that time except that one verse. And it's kind of interesting to think about what, what he could have been taught those days in Arabia. Um, so in Acts chapter 9, uh, back to Acts chapter 9, um, I was thinking about that a lot, a lot about Paul's alone time there and just how awesome that is and how like really <clears throat> what a time that must have been it, I was just a food, food for thought I've heard through different commentators and other theologians they believe right there at that uh, what is it where he was in uh, Arabia was it mm -hmm. they believe that was around the same place where the law was given where Paul received the 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 because really the message of grace, the grace of God and the cross was only through Paul. Mm -hmm. He was one of the, if you read the epistles, so yeah. uh, they believe that right there at that that mount was the same place where the law was delivered, but then the, the gospel of grace was delivered through the apostle Paul there. That's just what... That's an amazing thought. Uh, <laughs> research. Uh, yeah, I'd like to look into that. So really, because God does that, you know, like when you look at Mount Moriah, yes. um, you know, you look at Mount Moriah, Abraham brought Isaac up to Mount Moriah. Um, there's sacrifice there. You see David by the threshing floor, Mount Moriah. You see the cross in Golgotha, uh, Mount Moriah. <laughs> it's just like it's like God does those things, and it's it's really a beautiful thought to think of. Like I'd love to research that out um, because God, it's, it's amazing how He does that. Um, so Acts chapter nine, and it says, and there was a certain dis disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision. Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. That's the response. If God ever gives a vision or whatever, it's always, I am here, Lord. He did it to Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, also in 1 Samuel, um, where he's the call to Samuel, um, you know, the, the prophet there, uh, Eli, right? Uh, so Samuel's like, Hey, I'm hearing these things. And Eli's like, You say, Here I am, Lord. <laughs> like, that's, this, this is the response is, Tell him, Here I am, Lord. I'm, I, I, your servant hears, right? Um, so Ananias, the Lord appears to Ananias in a vision. Ananias, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight and inquire in the house of Judea for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prays. Behold, he prayeth. You know, Paul in his fasting was praying. He was praying to God. Um, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that carry thy name. It's like Ananias saying, that must be somebody else named Ananias. <laughs> I think you have the wrong number. <laughs> uh, I think we did. Um, because, I mean, and that just shows the kind of person Saul was. Uh, but the Lord said unto him, go your way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. To bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Um, the great things that Paul would suffer. Um, and he didn't say, the, uh, I will show them him how um, the wonderful plan I have for his life. Or the, how he will have his best life now or anything like that. He said, I'll show him the things which he will suffer. And if you look at, I mean, we mentioned it um, kind of in passing, but we're, let's turn there really quick in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, or 2 Corinthians chapter 11, sorry. 1 Corinthians, uh, Corinthians chapter 11. 11. Um, 
in verse 23, let's read through these really quick. When it talks about Paul's suffering, um, it's like, it's pretty amazing. It says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. There were people that were coming into Corinth saying, Paul's not an apostle. I'm an apostle. You listen to me. I have wealth and talking and I'm a smooth talker. I'm a real apostle. And Paul was saying, you want to know my, um, the proof of my apostleship? Look at the stripes on my back. That's the proof of my apostle. They don't have stripes on their back. They've never been stoned to death. They've never been shipwrecked. And that's what he's saying here. And the reason why he's saying this, um, it says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more f- frequent. In deaths often. Of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which comes upon me daily, the care of all the churches, who is weak, and I am not weak. Who is offended and I burn not. And in the next chapter, he talks about this thorn in the flesh, which is also another form of suffering in him. And he's saying, like, like this is my this is my apostleship. So the Holy Spirit, in Acts chapter 9, the Lord says, I will show him what things I will he will suffer for my name's sake. Paul suffered. And in Philippians chapter 3, the next in 2 Corinthians 12, it says that. His grace is sufficient for the sufferings. And in Philippians 3, 8. 3, verse 8. He talks about the, his, his authority. <coughs> and he says, um, like, like in all of his, his credentials, really, in, in verse 8, he says, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. So Paul, he suffered a lot. He suffered the loss of everything. He may suffer the addition of hardships. And he says, all for the excellency of knowing Christ, right? That's, um, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ, that I may win Christ to kind of have that in our heart um, that's our life and our call and we're actually the next class we're going to talk a lot about calling in, uh, in Acts chapter 9 but that the purpose of it all is that we would win Christ you know that's the reward the reward's not health or you know like we, we might get put in a position where we're, we're, we're hungry for a bit or we're sick or like, like whatever may happen but we might win Christ through it you know that that's through our pain, through suffering, that we would actually know Jesus. And that's we're so much more than any kind of riches that this world might offer. You know, like we might have prosperity in this life, but we need to know Christ. We need to know him in all things. That I would know him, um, I think right there also in Philippians chapter 3, that I would in fellowship of his sufferings, right? Sorry, we don't have to turn there. It's actually pretty on. But he's like, that, that, that I would know that I would be in fellowship with his sufferings. I would fellowship with Christ in the sufferings. And so the Holy Spirit is telling Ananias here, like, go get him, pray over him, he'll receive his sight, and then I have to show him what he'll suffer. But, you know, the, but, but Paul, after he, Paul said, and, and, and during Philippians, he was actually, he was in prison during the, the, the writing of Philippians. He was in house arrest in Rome. And he's like, ha, it's all worth it. It's all worth it. On his way there, he was shipwrecked and bitten by a snake, right? It's all worth it. It's, it's, it's all for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. All of it. Um, and it's, it's kind of, and we'll see that here. You know, like we'll, we'll talk about it if we ever get through this book of Acts. Um, we'll, we'll talk about it. Some of Paul's shipwrecks and stonings and beatings and um, really the amazing life of Paul the Apostle. So we'll end this class there. So, Father, bless these words. Bless this night. Thank you. In Jesus' name.